by God's grace, I'm going to try to get us through Acts uh, 15. Uh, not all tonight, but um, tonight and uh, next Tuesday as um, God gives us the grace to get through this book together. So I'm going to, start, I'm going to read down uh, through the section I hope to get through tonight with you guys as we look at the, the scripture together, and then we'll start back up from the top and kind of like break it down uh, little by little and uh, see what the Lord might say to us as uh, we look at these things. So starting with Acts chapter 15, verse 1, it says, And certain men came down from Judah and taught the brethren, Unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. Therefore, when Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and dispute with them, they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain others of them should go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and elders about this question. So being sent on their way by the church, they passed through Phoenicia and Samaria, describing the conversion of the Gentiles, as they and they caused many or they caused great joy to all the brethren. And when they had come to Jerusalem, they were received by the church and the apostles and the elders, and they reported all things that God had done with them. But some of the sect of the Pharisees who believed rose up, saying, It is necessary to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. Now the apostles and elders came together to consider this matter, and when there were been much dispute, Peter rose up and said to them, Men and brethren, you know that a good while ago God chose among us that by the mouth of the Gentiles should hear the word, by, by my mouth, that the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. So God, who knows the heart, acknowledged them by giving them his Holy Spirit just as he did to us and made no distinction between us and them purifying their hearts by faith. Now, therefore, why do you test God by putting a yoke on the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? Thinking of yokes and necks. Let me think of this on my neck. Um, but we believe that through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved in the same manner as they. Then all the multitude kept silent and listened to Barnabas and Paul, declaring how many miracles and wonders God had worked through them among the Gentiles. And after they had become silent, James answered, saying, Men and brethren, listen to me. Simon has declared how God at first visited the Gentiles to take, them out, of, take out of them a people for his name. And with this, the words of the prophets agree, just as it is written, after this, I will return and will rebuild the temple of David, which has fallen down. I will rebuild its ruins, and I will set it up so that the rest of mankind may seek the Lord. Even all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord, does all these things. Says the Lord who does all these things. Known to God from eternity are all his works. Therefore, I judge that we should not trouble those from among the Gentiles who are turning to God but that we should write to them to abstain from things polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, from things strangled, and from blood. For Moses has had throughout many generations those who preach him in every city, being read in the synagogues every Sabbath. Verse 22, Then it pleased the apostles and elders with the whole church to send chosen men out of their own company to Antioch with Paul and Paul. And Barnabas, namely Judas, who was also named Barabbas and Silas, leading men among the brethren. So this chapter begins one of the most pivotal points in church history, um, especially for all of us who are non-Jewish, because <laughs> this is where the big meeting, the head honchos, People that the pillars that we see G, walking around with Jesus in the Gospels, James, and we don't, John was probably there, he's not mentioned in this chapter, 
but uh, John, and then we see obviously Peter is a part of this uh, little dissertation, as well as Paul, who did amazing work among the Gentiles. Leading up to this point, uh, you guys may have saw, I think Pastor uh, Neil may have discussed this, and y'all read through some of this last week, uh, some of the missionary journey, of the first missionary journey that Paul and Barnabas were sent out and commissioned out on back in Acts chapter 13. And you see a lot of interesting stuff in there uh, because um, and I'll talk about it a little bit as we dig down and dig through some of this chapter together. But it's just my first thought about, you know, talking about this missionary journey that Paul had went on and, and how powerful the Lord was when he uh, and how he used them in a, just a powerful way. It just is an encouragement to me. And I would like to be something that you guys think about. And us as believers in general think about because it's really predicated upon what the Lord told us to do when he said to go into all the world to proclaim the gospel and to make disciples. I found personally one of the most difficult things and one of the most blessed things that I've ever had in my walk with Jesus is doing what he said and going forth and making disciples. Not just personally and practically in our own location Maybe at our work or with our families. Yes, absolutely. You know, that should be something that we do. Biblically, it's what we should do. But when we go out of our element and go forth to share the gospel, there's great power when we do that. And there's always a little bit of spiritual contention, reservation, holding back that, that, that creeps up in our flesh. You know, part of us thinks, don't do it. Well, I got this going on. Other plans, all this other stuff starts becoming sort of distractions. I know it does for me. I don't know about everybody else, but I know it does for me as I think to step out. Like, yeah, we're going, you know, we're going to do an outreach this Saturday with the church or something. You know, yeah, this is going on, that's going on. But I'm going to do this outreach. And all of a sudden, more stuff comes up than I even expected before. And it's, it's a fight. It's a battle. But we do see there's such a blessing you know, and I like the way Paul and Barnabas, these guys, sought the Lord with prayer and fasting before they went. They really wanted to be hearing from the Lord when they stepped out. And it is important, but, you know, keep in mind that your flesh has got to be crucified somewhere along the way before you can experience the blessing and the joy that we see these guys get uh, from this. So we're looking at verse 1 and 2, and it says, A certain man came down, and this is, after the journey had finished up, they were in Antioch. This is uh, Antioch in Syria. Um, sorry, I don't have a lot of maps. You could probably look at a map in the back of your Bible if you have one. A lot of them have Paul's first missionary, second missionary, third missionary journeys. Kind of see the proximity of these things. But it's Antioch, Syria, which had become, was becoming known at this time for being sort of a, a capital, if you will, of Christendom for the Gentile world, sort of a way of viewing it. And it says there were certain men that came down from Judea, that was from the area of Jerusalem and all that, that came down from that area and taught the brethren, this was the brothers in Antioch, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. Therefore, when Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and dispute with them, they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain others of them should go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and elders about this question. This is a really interesting thing. We, uh, you look back, I'm going to turn back over, you can, and I'd encourage you guys to read this more in depth or even go online and listen uh, to some of the teachings Pastor Dave's already taught through in uh, the book of Galatians. Paul brings this account that we're reading about here up in Galatians. I'll read from it. Uh, chapter 2 of Galatians, and then Paul's like recounting this in verse 1. It says, Then after 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas and also took Titus with me. And I went by revelation and communicated to them that gospel which I preach among the Gentiles. Paul's given us a little more insight, perspective on the chapter we're reading tonight. But privately, he says, I, he says here, I went up by revelation, communicated to them that gospel which I preach among the Gentiles. This is speaking of his going up there, but privately to those who are of reputation, lest by any means I might run or had run in vain. Paul took this 
account of meeting in Acts, uh, these people in Jerusalem, these Judaizers, is what he calls them throughout in Galatians as well, he took it serious. He didn't take it like some lightweight thing. You know, they come up from Judea and they're starting to tell people, hey man, unless you're circumcised, you can't be saved. And you're, you're talking about a group of Gentiles, obviously, that know about circumcision, which was a covenant that God had given Abraham. We know from the Hebrew scriptures. How you doing? <laughs> we're small enough group. What's up? But um, we're in Acts 15, by the way. <laughs> if you didn't know, we're doing verse by verse. If you want, you can get a Bible right there. Or I can get you one. Here. I like your shirt. That's cool. But um, so anyway, Acts, um, we see Paul had a respect. He, he definitely, we see there in verse Two, that Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and dispute with them. That just means they were really ticked about this situation going on because they're proclaiming the liberty, the freedom, the joy of what the gospel brings, right? And these people are coming up and dropping this burden uh, that we see on the disciples by saying this. And yet somehow in their persuasion, we see that they actually get Paul to come down, basically it's travel 300 miles. You know, it wasn't like, hey, just get in the car, let's go down to Jerusalem. You know, <laughs> I mean, it was, it was you know, a, a big feat in those days to make that court of uh, thing. Man, I went past much. Sorry, I lost my spot. Galatians 2 is where I'm reading back from. So Paul took this seriously, and he did this in a respectful way. As we see, he came, he didn't just come in and do this in a haphazard communication with a big group of people just standing by the wayside in Jerusalem that were believers sitting there in the congregation say, hey, what are you guys coming up? I mean, he didn't do anything like that. He treated the situation in a respectful way. And no doubt he was angry in communicating with these guys at first, but seeing it perhaps perception-wise as an issue that needed to be dealt with in a larger capacity. Because no doubt these guys were coming sort of as representatives from Jerusalem. Let's finish up this Galatians 2 real quick. In verse 3, so Paul was saying he didn't want to come off as though he was doing his work in vain. Verse 2, Galatians 2. In verse 3, Galatians, it says, Yet not even Titus, who was with me, being a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. Paul had seen the fruit of this man's life that was with him. And he's like, man, this, this guy doesn't need to be circumcised. And he, he knows this trip that they're trying to lay on them. And this occurred because of the false brethren. This is the identity of those in Acts chapter um, um, verse, verse, verse 1. This is the identity uh, over here in Galatians 2. That this seek, these false brethren secretly brought in who came in to self stealth to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ, that they might bring us into bondage to whom we did not yield submission even for an hour, that the truth of the gospel might continue with you, speaking of those in Galatia. But those from whom it seemed to be something, whatever they were, it makes no difference to me. God shows personal favoritism to no man. Those who seemed to be something added nothing to me. But on the contrary, when they saw that the gospel for the uncircumcised had been committed to me as the gospel for the circumcised was to Peter, for he worked effectively, uh, the apostleship to the circumcised also worked effectively in me toward the Gentiles. So Paul gets further into it. I encourage you to read further in Galatians if you want to get a broader, expanded perception of what's going on in this scene and how Paul's dealing with some of this in the church there in Galatia. Back to our uh, text here. Paul's angry over this issue. He makes his way out and down. In verse 3 it says, um, I'm losing my sight. So, so being on, sent on their way, this 300-mile trip by the church, they passed through Phoenicia and Samaria, describing the conversion of the Gentiles, and they caused great joy to all the brethren. You see, somehow in this situation, these guys coming up, trying to lay a trip, on the believers there in Antioch, these Gentiles just got saved, 
And these Jew- Jews come up here, hey, you got to get circumcised. You know, that had to be a painful thought in their head, right? <laughs> we got to get circumcised? What? Part of me wonders about this thing with circumcision back in the New Testament days. I mean, I'm sorry, it's hopefully not a negative thought, but I mean, what? How did you know? I mean, what did they do? What was going on in these meetings? Be like, are you circumcised? I don't know. Let me see. Oh, yeah, you're good. Go in. I mean, what was going on in these things? I don't know. But it's, 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 it's just a, it's a weird thing for a person that's non-Jewish to say, hey, yeah, I accepted Christ. Yeah, I'm free in the Lord. And all of a sudden, you need to be circumcised. And, and to, for them to sneak in and stir up this stuff in the believers. But Paul and them going down, they start describing in this situation, it seems to push them into Paul into the reality of the freedom they have in the gospel. And he doesn't lose heart in that, as we read in Galatians 2. He didn't receive that message that they brought, but he had joy in continually sharing what God had done with the Gentiles. And he kept that joy in his heart. He didn't allow the situation, the legalizers, the Judaizers, these men coming up trying to lay a trip on him. Man, you got to do this or you ain't saved. He didn't allow that to affect his joy, the freedom he had in the Lord. You know, it could have easily, I like the little thing Pastor Dave does sometimes. I've seen him do it with like a bottle of water. I can get my Bible. It was like you get a situation in your life, a circumstance that comes up, maybe at work or at home or whatever the case may be. And oftentimes we have joy like, yeah, man, God, it's so good. This is good. You know, and then and the, the situation comes and what happens? Boom. We give our joy away. But Paul didn't let that happen. And not only does does he not let that happen, he continues in the joy. He's building other people up. These places where they establish elders in the chapter before, they go back through there, and they're just pumping them up, man, with a testimony of what God did among the Gentiles as they go. Verse 4, And when they had come to Jerusalem, they were received by the church and the apostles and the elders, and they were reported... You hear this a couple of times in this meeting. They reported all the things that God had done with them. And so there's this continually bringing out the joy, bringing out the good things that God had done, that they're sharing among the upper echelon of the first church, the first big church meeting with the big kahunas, you know, the people that walk with Jesus, Peter and James and whatnot. Back down to verse 5. But, here they come again, some of the sect of the Pharisees who believed. Now, There is an indication here that many Pharisees in Jesus' time period, after Jesus resurrected from the dead, actually believed the gospel. They actually came to a saving faith. They actually experienced the freedom of the Lord by embracing what he did on the cross in the gospel. But they got this attachment that they bring in them with them. And they're saying, it is necessary to circumcise them, this same group, command them and command them to keep the law of Moses. So not only is it the first trip, hey, you got to be circumcised. Now you have to keep the whole law of Moses. Man, these people are making it bad, right? (laughs) What happened to the joy of the gospel, man? You know, the freedom that we have in the Lord. You got to get, you got to cut yourself to be a part of that team now, and you got to keep. I wrote this down: six hundred and thirteen laws. Man, 613 laws, that's a lot of laws when you think about it. Now, our country's probably got more than that, but that's a lot of laws. You know, there's 365 negative commands, prohibitions, one for every day of the year. I mean, that's, 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 that's an extra trip that, that these guys are like, ugh, you know, I just received the Lord, and these guys are saying I got to do this. Now, in verse 6, we see, uh, see, 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 see the consensus of this group coming together. Now the apostles... And the elders came together to consider the matter. And when there had been much dispute, Peter rose up and said to them, Men and brethren, you know that a good while ago God chose among us that by by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. So Peter's getting ready to share with them. He's standing up in the midst of this conversation, this dispute Uh, among some of these Judaizers that are there, he stands up and he's recalling. If you remember back in Acts chapter 10, he's recalling this instance of uh, Cornelius, no doubt, I would believe, that uh, God used Peter to share the gospel. And God did a profound revelation. He saw the threefold 
a vision that he had from heaven. God rolled out these unclean animals, so to speak. And, uh, and, and Peter saw it. He said, no, no, Lord, no, Lord. And then finally he submitted and obeyed the voice of the Spirit and went down and shared the gospel with Cornelius. And it was like just in a second, man. I mean, Peter hadn't even made the altar call, right? The Holy Spirit just boom right on top of him. And it was an evident witness that it was a God thing, right? And, uh, you know, Cornelius spoke in tongues, and they sent an usher in to escort him out. No, I'm just kidding. They didn't do that. But no, it was, it was, it was a clear God moment. The Spirit was given, and he was just, just had just barely got the word out of his mouth before God responded and showed up in a powerful way. And, and this, this meeting, this word is being heard among them. Let's continue on here. Uh, reading through, where was that? Eight. So here we go. Verse nine. And made no distinction. No, verse eight, sorry. So God, who knows the heart, acknowledged them by giving them the Holy Spirit just as he did to us and made no distinction between us and them. So there's no distinction with God. Peter's making evidence with his testimony, purifying their hearts by faith, simply believing trusting in the Lord, just simply trusting in the Lord. That's how their hearts were purified by the gospel. Now, therefore, why do you test God by putting a yoke on the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? That's a good, good, good word. In verse 11, it says, But we believe that through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved in the same manner as they Let's look back at that verse 10. Now, therefore, why do you test God? Why are, why, are, why are these, they're calling out these little, as Paul labeled them, secret brethren in chapter 2 of Galatians. Why are you testing God? Laying this extra trip on people about what the gospel is and isn't. And I wrote out a short list. I was listening through commentaries and things. Um, this is typically how I because I work a lot. <laughs> I don't have time to sit around and read, read, read. I read too, but, but I was listening to a lot of different things, and, and I, I pulled out a few points about legalism, because this is what's happening uh, in this situation. This is the first test, if you will, as it relates to the gospel, um, and, and it's a test in our own heart and a, and a question that we need to ask ourselves from time to time just to keep our hearts in check with what the Lord says. Why do we test God by putting a yoke on the neck of his people, his disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? Peter's just being so straight up with these guys. It's like, look, man, we couldn't keep that law, man. What you thinking, man? 613 commands. Come on, guys. I mean, <laughs> there's no, we're not doing this. We, can't, we couldn't even do it. Let's just be real. We can't do this, all right? And, and, and he's saying, why are we going to do this? Why are we going to th put this trip on him? I wrote down five different things. And you can maybe, uh, if you've got pen, you may want to write them down. And I'll do some biblical um, references. So hopefully you can get something out of it. Look at these later. Think them through later. Pray them through. Think about them in your relationships with other believers, maybe with your spouse, maybe with your kids. Um, but some, some practical things that we see, I think, from Scripture that relate to these things about instead of being a joy giver like Paul was, things that we might actually slip into, which is becoming legalistic and being a burden bringer. Instead of a joy giver, we can become a burden bringer if we slip into these little things. So I wrote down a few. First one is because, number one thing is because we sincerely care about people. Sometimes because we do sincerely care about people, we'll fence them in, we'll try to put them in a situation, and it's because we care about them. And I ain't saying that all that's 100% wrong. It's not wrong if we got good biblical guidance through the Spirit on it, right? But there are, this is one of the trips that the Pharisees did. They wrote, um, for example, they had the Sabbath. That they, you know, God says, hey, take a day off. That's what God said, right? Take a day off. There, the Talmud, which is kind of a commentary written by the Jewish people on certain things, has seven volumes 
on how to keep the Sabbath. <laughs> take a day off. I mean, God says, hey, take a day off. But man, what does he do? He gets seven volumes together on how you need to be at rest, right? You know, and there's all kinds of trip hazards written within that. Just that one item, you know. I mean, they, they, they say you can't. Uh, they put all these stipulations surrounding it. And, uh, you know, because they feel like they don't want people to break that commandment, right? And not take that day off or that day of rest. I mean, you, they have it today in Jerusalem. They got a Shabbat elevator because they don't want you to push a button. Because that constitutes his work. And if you push the button, you're working on the Sabbath. And therefore, you're breaking the Sabbath. You're breaking God's command. Who said to take a day off, right? There's, uh, they, they say not to spit on the ground, in the dirt. Because you spit on the ground, in the dirt. The spit becomes mud. You can make bricks with mud, which constitutes work, right? <laughs> it's, it's just an on and on and on and on and on sort of thing that, that goes on around that. But it's because sometimes we sincerely care about people, sometimes we'll, we're tempted to maybe actually put a trip on someone. You know, we're tempted to say, well, you can't do this or you can't do that. You know, I mean, there's a there's hundred different things I could, you know, think of that surround that. I mean, you know, we do it. I mean, I'm tempted. I have my own convictions, and that's fine. Have your own convictions about certain things. But projecting them on someone else, you get in that danger zone of legalism, right? You know, it's like, like I had a conviction. I didn't kiss my wife, my second wife, but my last wife, <laughs> until we were married. Ain't nothing in Scripture about that, right? I mean, I ain't going to lay that trip on you. Maybe you're good. You know, you're fine. But for me, it would lead down a bad path and potentially get in a bad situation. So we just made a mutual decision to do that. But it's not something I'm projecting on you. It's not in the Word to say to do that or not. <laughs> you know, that's, that's, that's up to each his, each his own man, right? So there's conviction of conscience. The second thing is secretly desire. Sometimes we secretly desire control over people. It's, it's, it's a really um, a tricky thing that we see. There's a lot of examples in Scripture of this. We see it in politics today. Um, one of the things, um, 1 Kings chapter 12, when Solomon uh, basically gave the kingdom, he had passed away, gave the king over to his son Rehoboam. And there was a situation where Rehoboam got the counselors together and um, some of Solomon's counselors, and they said, hey, you know, your dad had kind of laid a heavy burden on us with taxing. And he said, they said to, to Rehoboam, he's like, hey, man, why don't you just lighten it up a little bit, lighten up this burden, this yoke, if you will, on us, and, uh, and the people will serve you, respect you, love you, and, and, and all this. And uh, he said, and, and they said, and he said, well, okay, I'll, I'll listen to that. And then he listened to some of his younger guys. And they said, nah, man, you need to get these people in control and he said yeah you're right you know he listened to the younger counselors and they laid even a heavier burden on the people for this tax thing and what ended up happening the kingdom divided it divided because they laid this extra trip this secret desire to control the people by laying this burden on them right and it backfired and that's what generally happens anyway when you try to lay a trip out for somebody to uh, or lay something out for um, somebody to do because you want to some, have some desire to control them. They, and, and generally speaking, most people look for a way to get around all these, all these extra legalistic type things anyway. Humanly speaking, there's always looking for a way out. You know, like the Shabbat, they said you couldn't travel from your house because that would be sort of like work. You know, we're talking about that again. But they, what they would do back then was they'd tie a rope on to their house. Like they wanted to go somewhere, and the house was an extension, or the rope was an extension of their house, so they couldn't technically travel because of the Shabbat and these extra rules and stipulations they made. And so what they did was they tie a rope to the house, and then if they get to the end of that rope and it's not where they wanted, they needed to go a little bit further, they tie an extension and rope to that, and they'd keep going and going, and it'd be rope after rope after rope until they finally got to where they wanted to go. So there, there would always be a way to get around the law that they just created. You know, laying this extra trip. So the second one was secret desire control over them. Third thing I put is they selfishly need to be esteemed. They selfishly need to be esteemed. Jesus in Matthew 23, verse 4. I'll read that to you. Or we can play sword drills. You can get there before me. <laughs> 
23, verse 4, he says to the Pharisees, For they bind heavy burdens hard to bear and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. But all their works they do, they do to be seen by men. They make their phylacteries broad and enlarge the borders of their garments. They love the best places of feasts, the best seats in the synagogues, greetings in the marketplaces, and to be called by men, Rabbi, Rabbi, or Teacher, Teacher. But you should not be called Rabbi, for you have one God, one Teacher, the Christ, and you are all brethren. So we see Jesus alluding to this further with the Pharisees, some of the secret motives that they had to be esteemed. And it's interesting if you look at Philippians 2, the nature of Jesus, as he desired, or he, was, he made himself of no reputation. That's what the word says about us. And there's a dangerous thing in this, getting caught in a situation just because you want to look more spiritual. You could put out a pretense, like, yeah, man, I studied here, I do this, I know that, no, 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 no. And it's false. It's phony. And it's, and it's no way. Uh, for us to, to, to live. In Deuteronomy, um, I another scripture here, Deuteronomy 28, verse 7. Sword drills. <laughs> Where was that? 20, did I say that right? I might be looking at my notes cross eyed. 28, verse 47, yeah. And this is what God's telling the people concerning this thing of the yoke. It says, hmm, wait a minute, I think I got that wrong. 28, looking at my notes here, sorry, forgive me just a minute. It's 47, oh yes, here it goes. It says, because you did not serve the Lord your God with joy and gladness of heart for the abundance of everything, therefore you shall serve your enemies whom the Lord will send against you in hunger, in thirst, in nakedness, and in need of everything. And he will put a yoke of iron on your neck until he has destroyed you. You see an interesting contrast there, and you see it in Paul, I think, versus the legalizers. There's this sense of God's doing an amazing work here in Acts. There's this great sense of joy that Paul and Barnabas had it. They were like, man, people are getting saved. Lives are being changed. People are being set free and have this great freedom. And then here comes these guys that, hey, they got too much joy, you know. It was kind of like Jesus and the Pharisees all over again. Jesus has had joy when he walked around, and he enjoyed, he enjoyed sharing, enjoyed the company of the people, and he was blessed. And the Pharisees, they had that, like, scowl sort of look probably on their face every time they saw him coming. Because why? They were losing power. They wanted esteem. And that's something we got to guard our hearts about, too, as we walk with the Lord. It's, uh, it's, like I said, it's the third thing. And, you know, there's this interesting thing. You look at Ezekiel chapter 8. You know, Ezekiel, God gives Ezekiel this picture into the mind of the religious guys. And it shows how corrupt they were. He says, dig in this hole. And he digs in the hole and they look in. And he sees the hearts of these people that were in leadership, supposedly the spiritual leaders, and how corrupt and idolatrous they were on the inside. And it's, and it's an interesting thing in a perspective that God has, and he shows us, but there's this wickedness that surrounds this, and it's something to guard our hearts on as we follow the Lord. Number four is simplistically, we think that we know what's best for them. You know, Jeremiah 31 talks about how God has written as new believers, he's written on the tablet, tablet, table of our hearts his will and our following of him and our learning about him and our knowing him personally. He's written it in his word, but through the spirit for your life, for my life, he's written within our hearts what he, he, he wants to say to us in our lives. And in Philippians 2.13, it says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling didn't say work everybody else's issues out, you know, <laughs> it's work out, your, work, work you out, you know, yeah, you do that with good counsel and good things, but, you know, there's this trip that we walk around with and we can walk around with where we think we know what's best for people, 
And that's something that I believe is creeping up with these guys characteristically in Acts 15, these Judaizers, these legalizers, trying to lay this trip on these people. As we see these qualities, no doubt, all wrapped up in them. But once in a while, we get in our own situations, our own circumstance, and we think we know what's best for people, you know? And, and, we, and we, we, we try to project that sometimes. And sometimes you just got to, you know, stand back and just, and just let the Lord work it out in their own life and ask, you know, if they want advice, we say, hey, I can say, show them what the Word says, right? <laughs> this is how was God showing me. This is how I'm learning. You know, I don't know what for you things might be. Number five, we sadistically want to share our misery with them. We sadistically want to share our misery with them. This is another temptation of laying a yoke upon somebody. These Judaizers wanted, they, they, they maybe felt miserable about their circumcision, perhaps. And what does misery love? Company. <laughs> right? They didn't want to feel like, ah, man, you guys got to be circumcised like us. Come here, feel the pain, you know? What kind of trip is that? That's <laughs> messed up, ain't it? But it, it's true. Some people, if you're around them, they gossip a lot, they talk a lot, and they're going through bad circumstances, and you're having a great day, you have joy, you're like, man, man, I was at church the other day, just enjoying the Lord, man, God's doing great things in my life. And then they come with their gossip and their bad day. Why aren't you upset? Why aren't you mad? Why aren't you feeling bad like me, you know? And they want to empathize with their misery. Philippians 3, verse 1 and 3. One little address more from Paul, and we'll finish the section we're in. Philippians chapter 3, verse 1 through 3. All right. Paul says this. He says, Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. For me to write the same things to you is not tedious, but for you, but it is safe. Number two, he's describing these guys, Judaizers. Beware of dogs. Beware of evil workers. Beware of mutilation. For we, that's the believer, are the circumcision who work, worship God in spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. So those five things, just real quick, I'll read them back to you. Ways that legalism creeps in. Number one is because we sincerely maybe start out caring about people. Number two, there's a secret desire to have control over people. Number three, there's a selfish, selfish need to be esteemed by people. Number four, simplistically we think that we know what's best for other people. And number five, sadistically we want people to share in our misery. Or we want them to share in our misery. Those are little snippets of things that we see in these Judaizers. And Paul calls them dogs. These are dirty dogs, man. Trying to lay this trip on these guys in Acts. These new believers that are free in Jesus Christ. They're dogs. That's how Paul describes them. And we see Jesus in Matthew 11, speaking of this thing that Peter talks about back here in Acts 15. Of the yoke. Peter says... Or Jesus says to us, Come unto me, all you that are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. That's what the Lord tells us. There's actually a, I did, I was going to go deeper on this, but there's a contrast to all these things that I just read, this short list. And I described some of these things to you about, you know, what Jesus says about them. You know, Jesus says, like in uh, the first thing, like he's talking about Sabbath. He says man was not, Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath, right? <laughs> it's not a trip you're supposed to make a seven-volume thing on. It's, it's God made this for man to rest. You know, this desire to have control over people. You know, Jesus, the flip side of that, he says, whoever wants to come, let him come. He looks at him in John chapter 6 and says, hey, you guys want to go? Go. <laughs> I mean, Everybody left. You know, he looks at him and says, hey, you guys want to leave me also? Tells his closest followers, you guys out of here too? And they're like, no, you have the words of eternal life. Um, you know, the third one, selfishly need to be esteemed by other people. Remember, Jesus has no reputation. That's his nature, learning from him. 
Uh, simplistically, we think we know what's best for him. Actually, Jesus does know what's best for you. <laughs> God does know what's best for you. So that's not a trip. That's just his way, his will, because it's a blessing. His yoke's easy, right? He don't, he don't come up here and say, hey, this 613 commands, do it! You know, he doesn't just drop that bomb on you. You'd be like, what? what? What's 583? I mean, we couldn't handle it, man. It, he, he didn't intend for us in that sense, too. And we want to share our misery with them. And the Lord, he wants to share his joy, his peace, his forgiveness, his eternal life in you through the Spirit and believing. And he's, he's given the joy out. He's not trying to take it out of you, per se. So let's read on here in Acts 15. We've got a few more minutes. Where was that? Okay. Verse 12. Then all the multitude. So Peter says this. But we believe in the grace. We're going to be saved the same way these Gentiles are saved in this counseling meeting. He shares his testimony. Verse 12, Then all the multitude kept silent and listened to Barnabas and Paul declaring excuse me, how many miracles and wonders God had worked through them among the Gentiles. This is, an, this is just an awesome thing. This comes up two or three times in the passage. The works that God had done on what? Their missionary journey. Their mission for God, stepping out in faith, sharing the gospel. It's something that's just reeling in their head. They're traveling that 300 miles down from uh, Antioch, Syria, to Jerusalem, and they're sharing it all along the way with the new believers, the joy of what God has done miraculously, supernaturally. You read back again in Acts chapter 14, you see some of the tidbits that went on during that journey, during that trip. And if you look at those carefully, what could Paul have extracted from this situation? What does human nature typically do? It goes for the bad, right? I mean, just typically, it goes for the bad, right? I mean, if, you, if I went out here and I shared the gospel today with like five people and I got hit in the head by four of them, typically I'd come back and be like, man, I got hit in the head by four people. You know, I wouldn't be thinking, wow, I just shared the gospel and people got saved or something. But Paul, and you look at those situations he was going through on this missionary journey prior to this meeting, he took the joyful, good experience of those trips and shared it. That was part of the package. He didn't let the, the, the difficulty of almost getting stoned to death, right? And uh, if you look back at Acts 14, uh, wherever, what is it, was it Iconium or Derby? Yeah, Barnabas, you know, part of the Derby. Back in the yeah, it was over there in um, Iconium where they had one minute, or Lystra, I'm sorry. Lystra, in that area, there's a few areas they went through, getting stoned, to, and they thought he was dead. They drug him out of the city. If I, you know, what, what would happen if our modern missionary went out and almost got killed physically? We would come back, and all we would hear is about that and how he needed secret service and people to be around him if he was sharing the gospel. Or we would hear just, man, did you see what God did over there? You see what God did over here? He's sharing a testimony. There's three things I want you guys to get that's incredible and it makes the Bible studies that you uh, sit through in here or wherever that you're at or your own devotional life. But three things that you can get that will take you a long way personally and practically in your walk with the Lord. And I just wrote these things down. The first one, I call them spiritual stability. I just, I just got this little phrase in my head, whatever. Spiritual stability 101, I call, is hearing the promise. You hear the word. Faith comes by hearing, hearing comes by the word of God. You hear a promise for your situation, spiritually. More particularly, the Lord divides it out. He divides it out differently. You know, I might, I'm looking at this chapter, and I'm thinking about my own life, and I'm thinking about, you know, Lord, how can I grow in this and that? And you're reading the same chapter, Spirit's working on you, and you're thinking about something totally different, probably, right? But you hear a promise that's from God, number one. Number two, spiritual stability 102, you experience that promise. You apply it. You don't just hear it, know about it. You know, people got lists everywhere. People have been Christians for years. That I see them, they just got like this stone cold look on their face. It's like, mm, the drudgery of being a Christian. Oh, look how bad the world's getting. You know, this is the pastor Dave calls it the Eeyore mentality. But man, if you get a hold of that promise, God's speaking to you personally, even if you do that tonight. And there's some in here. But whatever the ones you get and you apply it, 
That's when you experience the power. The power of, of God working in your life. And you're being built up in that promise. You're not just going through the list and listening to this and that and the other. You're taking a hold of what the Spirit's wanting to, to you to obey today. And when you take hold of that, you're blessed personally and practically. Paul and them, these guys are probably elated, right? I mean, after a 300-mile trip, I'm thinking of taking a nap. You know, they're coming in. They're still blowing fumes about, man, God's done this, you know, and he's sharing it, and they're just constantly being built up. They're seeing miraculous things, no doubt, but they're obeying the promise of being that, living that call out that he told them, hey, you know, go out. The Spirit's sending you guys out to share the gospel. In spite of, in uh, verse uh, chapter 14, it says, in spite of, Verse 22, second part of that says, We must, must through many tri tribulations, enter the kingdom of God. And he's going, you can read chapter 14, you're like, what is he so excited about? Getting rocked, <laughs> literally? What is he so stoked about? I mean, praying and fasting, I mean, what, 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 you know, but he's seeing the promise being fulfilled. That's what he's stoked about. That's why he has joy. And he ain't letting nobody take it from him. He's stiff-armed. Them Pharisees come in, it's just like a blocker. You know, he puts his arm down. Whatever, man, I ain't listening to that. I got my joy. You ain't getting that. It's like holding that ball in his hand, you know, in his heart. The third thing, uh, you experience the promise. That's when you get your testimony. Revelation 12, 11 talks about it's how, how that's a powerful tool in your heart. But the third thing, spiritual stability 103, share that promise with others as the Spirit leads. Share your experience what, how you've experienced God's promises with other people. I mean, that's how you get built up in the Lord. That's how we build each other up. I can't, I hadn't experienced everything. I hadn't. I mean, I don't, I don't want necessarily want to experience everything either. But you've experienced things that are unique. You've seen God work in your life in a unique way. And somebody else needs to hear that. That's, you got lesson one, hear the promise. Lesson two, experience the promise. Lesson three, you share as the Spirit leads your experience with that promise. That's a big part of us hanging out together on a men's study. Is like, and we try to have this time at the end. All right, a few minutes, we'll finish up. But, you know, is, is, is that God wants you to, to, to glean from other men, to grow with other men, to grow with other people in the body together. It's a team effort. We're part of Jesus together in this body of believers. And that's how we get strengthened and empowered. All right, let's get into James. James speaks up in this meeting. Uh, verse 13. And it's funny, this first part. And after, they had, after they'd heard Paul and Barnabas, just, just the, how stoked they were, what God had done among them, everyone became silent. Man, you see, nobody could speak against your testimony. I mean, people could say this or that or whatever. But nobody, it's your experience, man. Nobody can take that out from you. That's your experience. And, again, and everybody else could speak against it. No, you didn't experience miracles, Paul. Some Judaizer might say or be tempted to say because he's jealous of the spiritual impact they're having. We don't see that. Everybody's quietened up. And then James answered, saying, Men and brethren, listen to me. Simon has declared had God had first visited the Gentiles to take them out a people for his name. And with these words, and this is James just soaking in the spirit he has a fresh word from the from the scriptures he's going to share that confirms what they're already listening to he says and with the words of the prophets agree just as it is written after this i return and will rebuild the tabernacle of david which has fallen down and i will rebuild its ruins and i will set it up so that the rest of mankind may seek the lord even as all the gentiles who are called by my name says the lord who does all these things that's Amos chapter 9, verse 11 and 12. We're not going to have time to extrapolate the context from that, but I encourage you to read it. James is whipping out the word, which is totally appropriate, especially if you got a word from the Lord. Uh, Pastor Dave's encouraged us in this, especially when we have small groups or meetings, um, like a life group. You know, we do those as well. If you're not in one, encourage that. But there's so many words from the Lord, and this isn't something where, you know, all right, all right, your turn. Pull out the soapbox. You know, you preach, and that's it. It's not necessarily for that, but as the Spirit leads, you have a confirming word from the Lord. God's put it in you. Share it. And it's that wisdom that we see from above 
that James talks about. This is James, um, the brother of Jesus, not to be confused with James, uh, John's brother, who was actually killed. Um, I can't remember. You know, Steve, was he killed up beforehand? James killed before Acts 15 or after? Acts 12, that's right. Yeah. I thought, I'm pretty sure that he was. I didn't want to speak out of turn there. So, he'd already, so James, the, John's brother, had already been killed. So back down to verse um, 18. Known to God from eternity are all his works, says James. Therefore I judge that we should not trouble those from among the Gentiles who are turning to God, but that we write to them to abstain from things polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, from things strangled, and from blood. So don't eat anything that's got blood just spilling out of it. That's actually good health advice, too. <laughs> you might want to take note of that. That's biology. You know, this confirms. You're not a vampire. All right. Verse 21. For, God, for Moses has said through the many generations of those who preach him in every city, being read in the synagogues in every Sabbath. And then it pleased, there verse 22, the apostles and elders with the whole church to send chosen men of their own company to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas, namely Judas, who was also Barabbas and Silas, leading men among the brethren. So we see a couple of key noted people who are part of this leadership meeting there in Jerusalem. And we'll look and explore a little more deeply next round next week as we finish up this chapter uh, the context of some of these things that were mentioned and it's interesting how just in all simplicity it's interesting how this is the the core of Judaism I mean these people knew like I knew those first five books and the prophets like inside out right and these people are coming to this place of the gospel and so there's no doubt we don't know you know Paul amply describes these guys as dogs that are bringing this fake um, message about being saved through circumcision. That's pretty clear. And we don't know for exactly if this was just their upbringing, like overshadowing their um, circumstance. I can remember specifically when I got saved, it was at a, I was on my own. It was my experience. It was just, you know, I was kind of an atheistic, agnostic person. And I said, God, if you're there, man, I, I was sitting by the deathbed of my mom. I had a couple friends die in the culture of life I was living, not, not, not too far from that time period. My mom's body was still warm laying on the bed. And I knew that she had deliberately tried to share, like, the gospel, the real gospel with me. And I just kind of scorned it so often. But I thought, man, God, if you're there, if you're real, I need you to make yourself real to me. And I ask you to forgive me, and I believe that Jesus died for my sin, and I pray that you make me the man you want me to be. It was just something very simple. I cried that out to God, and I, and I had the experience. My experience was, was joy, was freedom, was peace of, of God flowing in my heart when I stepped on that promise, and that was my experience. And my heart had an appetite for, for whatever reason, had an appetite for this book, it had an appetite to know the Lord, to grow in the Word. But it's still, even at that point, I was saved. I was in a church construct that taught baptismal regeneration, which is a fancy word for saying they believe you had to go under the water to be saved, which is another, I would say, a trip. <laughs> if you read the whole of Scripture, understand that that's not exactly the case. And there was a season where I debated people over that. And I was new. I didn't know nothing <laughs> except that I knew a few scriptures that correlated with that. And I would share that with somebody. But the Lord graciously moved me away from it. I can't even pinpoint the exact point in time. But he just moved me away from that, those ideas and those thoughts. And I got more grounded in the word. And I'd read sections of scripture where Paul would basically wrote two-thirds of the New Testament. He said, eh, I'm glad I didn't baptize anybody. But I just shared the gospel. What did that <laughs> It's like, what? <laughs> that just ruined my theology. <laughs> but in, in these Judaizers could have been that way. They could have been sincere, right? Like that little list that I gave you. They may have just thought, man, we, we want to make sure these guys are going to heaven. Get them circumcised. Can you imagine being a Gentile on that day? <laughs> you just gotten saved, like, yeah, this is awesome. Somebody comes in and says, hey, come here. <laughs> I got that scene, those funny movies with the little guillotine with the, sorry. 
But, um, <laughs> but the Lord's good. The Lord is so good. And I heard, pray that you guys, you know, this is, if you didn't get all those notes, I think we'll try to upload this on YouTube. But, you know, those components do exist in us still, even as we grow in the Lord. We try to lay out things for people that we think they need to do and this and that. That aren't biblical. Now, there's biblical stuff we've got to follow, right? Because that's the word. But extra biblical things that aren't in the word. That, that we try to lay trips on people about. This, those tendencies creep up in us. They creep up in our family. Um, I mean, one thing to really pray about and think about is, you know, how was it really when you grew up? How was it really for you when you grew up? Especially if you're raising kids, right? How was it really for you when you grew up? How, how did you respond to things? And think about what Peter says there in Acts 15. You know, this is a yoke. This is a burden you couldn't even do. We couldn't keep this law. We couldn't keep this work. Man, we're, we can't do this. You know? And oftentimes, sometimes we'll lay a trip on our kids. It's like, man, I want you to do this. But it's not something biblical necessarily. You know, it's something to think about. You know, it's, um, I know as a father, it's something I think about. And I, you know, I, mean, I want aspire good things. But is it what the Lord's leading them in? Is this what God wants them to be walking in, right? I mean, obviously, we want them to walk in the Word, but, you know, you know how people can do sometimes. You know, want you to be this, want you to be that.